Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Welcome to Hong Kong Confidential. I'm Jules Hannaford and I'm your host. I'm an Australian woman and I've been living in Hong Kong for many years. I'm a mother, a teacher, an author, and I want to share my wisdom and the wisdom of others with you. Thanks for joining me and I hope you enjoy the show. You meet someone online and there's this instant connection. It's amazing how much the two of you just seem to click. They live somewhere far away, and there's some plausible reason they can't travel to meet you. They tell you they're in love with you, and you feel optimistic for the first time in a long time. They have a successful career, yet somehow they need money from you to solve a short-term problem, always with the promise of paying you back. Time goes on, and they need more money more urgently. You've started to see the cracks and begin to wonder whether they've been lying this whole time. All of a sudden, it hits you. You've been scammed. Fool Me Twice is the story of my mother, Jules Hannaford, a woman who was drawn into the dangerous world of sweetheart scams. After a trip overseas to meet a stranger, a dangerous altercation in a Manchester hotel room, and thousands of pounds lost for good, she's here to tell her story. Fool Me Twice, a true crime podcast, is available on Apple Podcasts, Ozcast Network, and anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Today I'm here with Jeanette Cadera. Hi, Jeanette. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Jules. Thanks for inviting me. Jeanette, you do a lot of work with refugees. Tell me what sort of things that you do to support refugees in Hong Kong. So actually, I've been working with refugees for over 15 years here in Hong Kong. Oh, I didn't know it was so long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually kind of become my life career, I suppose. Currently, through my organization and on personal capacity, we work with refugees to offer humanitarian aid, ensuring that they have a safe space, providing them with opportunities to live in dignity and hope in, in Hong Kong while they're in transition. Because the end goal is hopefully they get resettled to a third country because here in Hong Kong, they will never, ever get resettled. Oh, so it's very unlikely for somebody to get residency or citizenship in Hong Kong. Correct. Unless, of course, they are married to a local. Right. That's about it. Which countries do you repatriate them to, to sort of get citizenship and get settled? Typically, people or refugees in Hong Kong go to US or Canada. Unfortunately, that window of resettlement or door has kind of been closed for a while, given the global phenomenon. So that has been really difficult. So as a strategy at work, we've also changed the way that we help refugees because they tend to actually get stuck in Hong Kong for a long period of time. And I mean long. Like how many years are we talking? Like 15 years. (laughs) Wow. So There's even like between, I'd say, six and 10 years. That's quite an average. It's quite long. And that's a long time not to be working and earning an income, isn't it? Correct. What sort of support does the Hong Kong government give refugees? First of all, Hong Kong offers a safe place for them. While Hong Kong did not sign the Refugee Convention, they are actually processing their claims under a new system called Unified Screening Mechanism, whereby they are screened for torture under the Torture Convention, under the Refugee Convention, under the Inhumane and Degrading Treatment or Punishment Convention, the Bill of Human Rights, and the Right to Life. So these are the areas or conventions where they are screened for to see if the government of Hong Kong can offer protection for them. So they've got to meet at least one of those criteria? Is that all? Just one? Yeah, one or many. But if you could imagine, a refugee can actually tick all the boxes. I'm sure that's more common, isn't it? Than yeah. Just one, but they'd have to meet at least one for Hong Kong to then recognize them as a refugee and then offer them some sort of aid. Is that right? Yes. Actually, while still in process, the Hong Kong government is quite generous in the sense that they offer basic welfare assistance. So they get accommodation, 1500 
for an adult. So Okay, so that's not very much for people who outside of Hong Kong who are listening. Cheap rent would be if you're in a share house would be perhaps 5,000 a month, wouldn't it? That would be perhaps the cheapest rent you could find in a very small apartment outside of the central business areas. Correct. So 1,500 is nothing. Is very, really. very low. So they'd be in very, very small conditions or boarding houses and things like that, yeah, wouldn't they? Yeah, some of them in the past used to even like maybe live in those cage houses, but maybe to make ends meet, like they would probably share with many others, you know, just to be able to afford a place. And then it's literally sleeping space on the floor, isn't it? Correct. For our listeners out there that are outside of Hong Kong, again, the caged homes are basically that. They're sometimes called coffin homes as well. And they're just an area that's around about seven foot long and three foot wide. And that's where a lot of people live. And I believe they still have to pay one and a half to 2,000 rent for those, don't they, in Hong Kong? people pay 2,500. Oh, so do refugees get a bit of a cheaper deal, do they? Yeah, so that's why they have to maybe do other creative means to make ends meet. Or if it's a family, then the calculation per household increases. Oh, okay. Right? So, and as we all know, like Hong Kong is such an expensive city. There's a lot of like researches or surveys which shows that Hong Kong is actually really one of the most expensive property markets or places to live in. So they get 1500 for accommodation. They get food vouchers worth 1200 Okay, that again isn't very much if you consider what we spend on food per month. I mean, it's doable though, isn't it? But you'd have to shop very carefully. Problem is they don't get it in cash. It's oh. food vouchers or it's a card actually that has the value of that. And these are only specified or specific supermarkets. Compared to if they have it in cash, then they can go to the wet market, you know, and then look for best prices before they purchase. However, this is just in designated areas. Right. So that would make it very difficult then to imagine living on, gosh, $400 a week. It's almost impossible, isn't it? Exactly. Oh, actually, no, it's $300. My maths is terrible. Oh, so if you break it down, if, <laughs> yeah. you, if you break it down, that's actually $40 a day. Oh, that's $13 nothing, per isn't it? meal. So that's why we at the center, we have a soup kitchen. Oh, do you? Yeah. Does that mean that any refugees can come in and have lunch or dinner? Yeah. Any registered client of ours are free to access our meal service. We provide breakfast, lunch, and dinner five and a half days per week. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. So they must really appreciate that. Correct. And especially for new arrivals. So you got to remember, while the government extends minimal, basic, basic, basic support for this population... To access that support from day one, from when you first get here to that point, it might take up to six to seven months, to be honest, because of all the administration, the legal work, the paperwork. So that's why our center is crucial, you know, to this population. It's like from day one to the last day before they get resettled, we're here. We're here for them. You said that you offer humanitarian aid. Yep. What does that mean? Does that mean counseling or support if they've been through trauma or so actually all medical of the above, care? All of the above. So what we do, it's actually offer a comprehensive support system. That's from basic needs. So when you first arrive in our soup kitchen, emergency accommodation for children, babies and toddlers who have milk and diapers, because that 1200 that I mentioned earlier, they're very limited, right? You can't even buy a chocolate or a nappy. You know, they're very very specific as well. There are items that when it gets scanned at the teller, it will be rejected. So it has to be like wet food or the most basic. Oh my gosh. So how do they get nappies or formula for their babies? (laughs) Wow. We support about 108 children or babies at the center to get like a monthly supply of baby formula and disposable nappies. Do you rely on public donations or yeah. government funding? Or No, not government funding. We do not qualify to apply for any of those big government funding like Hong Kong Jockey Club or Community Chest because our clients or service recipients are non-Hong Kong ID holders. And it's actually the same with domestic migrant workers, even though they have Hong Kong ID, they still, you know, NGOs helping them are not qualified to apply for any government funding. It's just a mandate that they have. So yes, we do rely on the community. We get support from churches, individuals, some schools, and some corporate. But mostly we do it through grants and some of our outreach initiatives. All right. Do you also like then help people with 
doctor's visits and dental care yeah. and so, se- trauma counseling, things yeah. like that. Correct. So under our basic needs, so we have those. We also have clothing. We have our annual winter clothing drive because you could imagine most of them came here with just a backpack, really, right? So that's our basic needs. Then we also have education and training. We have mental health and psychosocial support where the counseling comes in. Because you could imagine most of them came from a very, very traumatic background. Even just the journey, the migration from their home to here is quite stressful. And then, of course, we have the outreach work and community engagement, whereby we, well, we inform, raise awareness around refugees. We work with a lot of schools. We work with a lot of churches. I think societies. that's such a good thing about yeah. Hong Kong is that there's quite a lot of money here and people are very generous and community minded, aren't they? Which means that people can get that extra support. Yeah, I mean, you'd think that, but in the early days we did struggle because as you could imagine, refugee is just not so sexy in Hong Kong, <laughs> but maybe that's going to change soon. It was a struggle, hence why one of our strategies is to raise awareness, right? Because It's not that they don't want to help the local community or the community at large. It's just that maybe they're not aware. First of all, Hong Kong has a long history of offering refuge to refugees since like, I mean, our organization alone has been working with refugees since the 1950s. How do you raise awareness about the plight of refugees in Hong Kong? What do you do? So we go to schools. We have an outreach package whereby schools, some companies, corporate, any groups, membership clubs can avail of them. So we have our standard presentation. We can tailor make programs or workshops. We also have our most popular. It's called Refugee Walk. It's basically, it's maximum of 25 guests. So we take them around our center. We take them just walking nearby the area because we're in Kowloon side. So we take them to a walk. Basically, it's a snippet in a refugee's life where most refugees would go to like the religious places, the small clinics, UNHCR, welfare assistance. And then the end of it is actually, and some partner NGOs as well, at the end is a home visit where they can see what that 1,500 can actually offer a refugee. We have some very open-minded and generous refugees and asylum seekers who would open their homes to the public just so that the public would understand that they're not here to just live the life, live the dream, or steal their resources. In fact, they would want nothing more but to go back home or be able to start their life somewhere else. Yeah. Tell me, what is the difference between an asylum seeker and a refugee? Okay, maybe we should start off by defining who a refugee is. So a refugee under the 1951 Refugee Convention states that he or she is outside of his or her own home country Fleeing persecution, well-founded fear on five grounds, actually. You've got race, nationality, religion, membership in a social group, or political opinion. So a lot of our refugee clients fled war and political opinion. An asylum seeker is someone seeking to be recognized as a refugee. It's just technical terms. It's just like once the government body or any screening body has confirmed that they have genuine fear, and they will then be given that status and they become okay, recognized so refugee. You, so you arrive in Hong Kong as an asylum seeker Correct. and then you apply for refugee status. Correct. Oh, got it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me some of the countries typically that refugees in Hong Kong come from? You've got the Sri Lankans from the Civil War. You've got some from Pakistan fleeing religious persecution or political opinion as well. You've got some from India. And of course, you've got from different countries in Africa. You've got from Rwanda, Burundi, Congo, Central African Republic, Uganda. These are all African countries that have a lot of conflict generally, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so people don't feel safe. And so they try to get somewhere so that they can get repatriated to a country where they can live safely. Correct. Why do you think people choose Hong Kong if, if they can't actually you know, get citizen status? Why would they come here in the first instance? Very good question. They didn't. Most of them didn't choose to come to Hong Kong because could you imagine like someone from Somalia knowing where or what Hong Kong is? A lot of them during the time of need, that very, very crucial moment where they had to leave their home and they've never been outside. Okay. That's all they knew. This little village in Africa or this little province in South Asian country. Their parents typically would pay for a smuggler or an agent, you know, pay lots of money to get them out of that country into a safe place. 
right? So that is typically what happens. And because Hong Kong has the visa on arrival, so that's why they mostly came here. And a lot of them were decisions by the agents. Some of them, if they're quite educated and they knew that Hong Kong has a good rule of law, you know, and human rights are actually respected here, then they would choose to come here. But very few knew actually where they were going to. I have this really, really classic story of an old client of mine. He's this young kid from Sri Lanka who at that time, he was, I think, 14 when he left home. He was being recruited by the Tamil Tigers, come and, you know, obviously fight for them. So being the head of their fishing village or the only son left there, they're all kind of disbanded, went to different countries. So his mom actually paid a lot of money to this agent and said, please take my son to Canada. So what the agent did, took the money, took the kid and dropped him in Bangkok and said, I'll be back. I'll just get food and never to be seeing this agent again with the kid's money, with the kid's passport oh, for no. real. So this kid had to be street smart overnight, literally. So anyway, he found UNHCR in Bangkok, got recognized as a refugee, worked illegally, and eventually found his way to Hong Kong. And we met, right? In Hong Kong, asylum seekers and refugee kids under the age of 18, 18 and under, can actually access the local schools. Oh, right? that's good. I yeah, didn't know it's, that. It's, it's, yeah. That's actually one of the best things about Hong Kong is that the kids' education may still continue, right? Especially if they're younger. It's a good prospect because education... Well, it's a basic human right, exactly, isn't it? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's good that they uphold that here in Hong Kong. Exactly. Yeah. How old was this boy when he first got dropped in Bangkok? 14. 14, wow. Correct. I met him when he was 17. And fortunately, his caseworker at the other NGO told him, oh, I don't want to apply you for this schooling system in Hong Kong because I don't think you're serious enough or you've got what it takes. So this boy was devastated, right? He just wanted to go to school. So anyway, I was like, right, okay, come here, my young Padawan. You know, I know we've got so many activities and programs at the center. And a lot of them I tested and tried with him because he's so like just, you know, full of energy. He is proud to be a refugee. So the outreach program, I actually grew it with him. Because he was one of those who would be confident to stand in front of an audience and say, I am a refugee. And this is my story. Wow, how fantastic. Oh, I know, I'm getting goosebumps. Yes, I so still remember I. him. I love him. What do you mean you created the outreach program with him? Well, we already had it before. Like there were a few like, oh, can you come to our school? Can you come to my company, to my group, talk about refugee issues? I said, sure. And then over time, I'm talking about it, right? About refugee issues. And I'm like, what better way to communicate this or who best to talk about refugee issues but a refugee himself? Then I go, hey, you. <laughs> Let's call him P for Padawan, my young Padawan. And I go like, do you want to try this with me? And he goes, okay, sure. And we practice. And then the more that we did it, the more he got better. And then to the point that he was actually doing like some, not arguments, discussions with the local kids. Because one of our good friends, you probably know her, Shirley, helped me put together like this anime of a refugee story so that it would, you know, because kids need visuals, right? And it's too like technical to explain. So then we created a video, a cartoons about Jimmy. It's Jimmy's story. And at the end of it, it would ask, would you help Jimmy? So at the end of our kind of intro in a school, especially in a local school, would ask, would you help Jimmy? Some would say yes. And ESF goes, yes, can I adopt him? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So cute. Very keen, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're just like, they understand, right? It's kind of a struggle in local system. Then this local kid said, why should we? Right? So he would say, why shouldn't you? You know? So he challenged their thinking. Yeah, yeah. And then our message is quite simple. It's like, it's a global phenomenon. And you don't know when the next refugee would come from, right? Like, come on, look at now what's happening in Hong Kong. It's quite telling. And refugee issues has been around for, okay, it was coined in 1951, but even way before that, we've had this issue like way before. Yeah, way before back when. they were even yeah, recognized. Exactly. Yeah, or exactly. have this technical term for it. Yeah. That was his story, right? So then, oh, he was just amazing. He has this mind of a, he probably didn't need formal education in the end. You know, he was too bright anyway. He likes technical stuff. He likes, you know, playing with computers, phones. 
He's a photographer too, right? And is he still in Hong Kong? He's been resettled to the US oh, and now works great. in one of the top international banks. Oh my gosh. Correct. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. How does that make you feel knowing that you helped that kid? I know. Isn't that incredible? And he just got like his- this little kid that was dropped in Bangkok all alone and you've helped him get to the US and into a top bank. It's amazing. Well, he did that all by himself, you yes, see. But he you did, did that all that by himself. It takes a village. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. And it's just so sweet because he keeps in touch. One of my colleagues actually went to the US a few years back and went to visit him. And he came in his fancy car going, hey, you know, and he is so, so well off now. He just got his permanent status as well. Oh, so that's now he brilliant. can freely travel. And I think he's going to come and visit me. Oh, that's <laughs> he amazing. He calls me his mom. I was like, maybe sister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm too young to be your mom. Does he keep in touch with his family? Okay, so here's another thing to so this boy. I kid you not. So there were, so I think there's like five or six of them in the family and they're spread all over the world. So him wanting to find his family just did everything. So he managed to find one of his brothers in Denmark and then another one in another European country. And then eventually his mom was found in Switzerland. Oh, so she got out as well. Yeah. Wow. So we had a colleague during his holiday, he went to visit this camp and then looked specifically for P's mom. And then when he got there, because P had like some gifts, you know, and pictures to show his mom. So my colleague went and presented everything, found her, right? The mother. And then you know what his mom said? That's not my son. Why? And turn around. Why? Because obviously from 14 to at that time, I think it was already 20. She didn't recognize he how had, much like, he changed. His face. Yeah. And also she said, no, 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 my son is in Canada. Oh, she never knew no, that he'd been in Bangkok and then Hong Kong. I think it took a while for her to recognize that that was her actual son. Wow. But just the stories that this kid has been through and to see him on top now, still having that humble heart. He's amazing. Oh, that's so So that's just one story, right? It's just one story. How did you get into this work with refugees in the first place? When I moved to Hong Kong, I worked for a year in Life Cafe. Do you remember oh, that? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. With, with Bobsy. With Bobsy. Yay. <laughs> yeah, I lost a lot of weight as vegetarian. <laughs> 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 From the Philippines, Mac, I need my meat. So anyway, I was, after a year, it was fun, right? I just finished uni as well. Then came here, and after a year, I was like, I'm not really using my brain, you know, or I just feel like I wanted to do something more. And then I met this Filipina who works for an NGO here. And I go, hey, do you have any opening from anything at all? I just want to work for an NGO because my background is international studies, major in consular and diplomatic affairs, but I didn't really want to work for a consulate. I just, you know, wanted to test the NGO field. And then she goes, um, yeah, but it's at the shelter for young refugees and families and distressed migrant workers and victims of human trafficking. I'm like, sure. <laughs> Sign yeah. me up. You know, Good but I had to like do night shifts and, you know, basically live there for three months. So I did. I wanted to. How was it to first get there? Was it really harrowing and sad or was it uplifting and rewarding oh, or God. was it everything? Uh, it was everything, but I think I was traumatized. Were you? Yeah, because I didn't also have the background of how you know, it was really my first refugee job. You didn't really know how much they struggled and some of the difficulties they may have faced yeah. getting to Hong Kong. But not only that, to live there with them, to see it for yourself, like to witness firsthand their suffering and the stories and how they lived or just young kids without parents, unaccompanied so you, minor. So you have a 20-year-old son now. 23. 23-year-old <laughs> son now. Yeah. So was he with you when yeah. you were living there? Wow. No, I had to ask my mom to come here and stay with us for a few months because I was doing night shifts, right? And then at times, I'll also bring my now 23-year-old there. So for him, you know, he kind of grew up with refugees too. How has that impacted him? Does that make him really socially conscious and more aware of the struggles that minorities face? Absolutely. I think a lot of young kids now, especially here in our island, right? A lot of these kids are open-minded. You know, they are exposed to the global phenomenon and our parents, like you and I, would expose them. 
they don't even think about it. It's something that they just grew up with. It's true because they are such global citizens yeah. living in this community with people from all over the world. So they become much more open-minded and tolerant and understand diversity and respect different opinions and yeah. different cultures and traditions and religions and all of that. So it's one of the benefits of growing up in Hong Kong, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's so diverse. And I think that made him a better young man. Oh, he's a wonderful young man, isn't he? <laughs> I like so, him too. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but that is amazing because you can kind of see that maturity and that kind of compassion in him, which maybe really was fostered at a young age yeah. when he was working with you in the refugee I mean, community. I mean, he still volunteers now. Whenever, Does he? Yeah, whenever he has free time or when I'm stuck, Josh, I need you. When mum now? Okay. <laughs> oh, isn't that lovely? Yeah, yeah. That's great. What has it taught you about yourself working with people in this community? Oh, I think it shaped not only my professional experiences and aspirations, but my personal values. Because it's like, it puts things in perspective, right? I mean, we all have our own drama and blah. We all have a lot of it, right? And sometimes, especially when I was a frontline worker, so I used to do casework. Now I manage and do programs and look for money. <laughs> Um, exciting stuff. Yeah. And I used to think like, oh God, and I thought I had a problem. Seriously. Yeah. It trivializes some of the things that we worry about when yeah. you look at the worries of other people. Yeah. And so it so can make like, you appreciate your own life and what you have and your privilege, can't yeah. it? Yeah. They inspire me basically. That's why I keep on asking myself, why are you still there? I didn't even realize I've been with the same organization for 10 years. Wow, that's brilliant. Yeah, and I still don't feel like it's been 10 years. Sure, maybe achievements-wise and how many people I've seen, I've encountered, I've helped. But work-wise, there's still something new and exciting every day. Wow, that's amazing. Tell me a bit about what it was like being a caseworker when you were on the front line. What were you doing? First, I mean, I should have left when, you know, after my experience at the shelter, because I was really traumatizing for a young officer at that time. I was just lucky that I had two social workers who mentored me. You would have been in your early 20s then. Yeah, I was yeah. like 23 or 24. I know, that's so yeah. young. And, you know, like I look at my son now. Okay, that's different because it's a bit more mature because I think this generation, it's just. They're very different to us because of the internet and social media yeah. and living in this global sort of world instead of the little yeah. sheltered Philippines yeah. where you grew up and Australia where I grew up. But to be fair, I was a single mom already at that time. So there is an inner strength there, right? But to yes, be fair. I was too. I had my <laughs> daughter at 23. See? Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't make you grow up fast, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. But still to be faced with all this, it's mm. like, whoa. But I think it also gives you that level of compassion and empathy and right. nurturing and all those things. I mean, I shouldn't say that because there'll be people out there listening who don't have children that have all of those values. But, oh, exactly. But for me, yeah. it helped me develop those or hone those skills when I was very young and very immature. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, if you never had to go through being a single mom or some of those challenges, that's also great because having to go through, not everyone comes up on the top, right? I mean, the refugees stories, they're not easy to tell. No, right. No, so not. for me, yes. I mean, it was traumatizing at the beginning. So I actually stayed away for a year. You worked for a while and then you had a year off. Yeah. Could you share one of these stories that had a huge impact on you when you first started doing the casework with the refugees? I mean, one of them was P, right? For example, another one actually was this young kid. Again, he was, well, I guess not a kid because he was a political refugee. He left because of, I think his family was like from a political family and his family members were slowly getting killed. Which country was he from? One of the African countries. Okay. I still can't say because, you know, That's the fine, sensitivity of, course. of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And he had to leave everyone behind, including his own family. And his wife actually was pregnant oh. at that time. So he never got to meet his youngest and possibly the only daughter. And yet he had to stand by his political opinion, fight for that particular opinion. Most of his friends were already killed. But I think for me, the kicker was that I'm still looking at him. He's so strong. He's so smart, and yet he's so kind. Even the adversities that he's been through, and to see him stand there so dignified, so strong-willed. And again, this is why I always go back, oh my God, you guys inspire me. It's like 
And I thought I had a problem. I still go back to that all the time. That's one of the many stories that constantly inspires me. But there's also like, not little things, but like say a young single mom whose three-year-old would pull her in 7-Eleven and point to a chocolate, a chocolate bar or candy, whatever. She said, I got no money. The kid would point to an ATM machine. Money, money. Because the kid probably sees people getting money from that machine. And to be like, I don't even have any money. Yeah, to say so it's no, sad, isn't it's it? It's very yeah. sad, right? And yet, you know, she's always laughing. She's always being positive in front of her kid. And I think it's just this stories that shape me. Well, storytelling is such an important part yeah. of our community and society. And hearing other people's stories can sometimes make you feel more compassion and want you to take action. And also, as we said before, your own privilege and make you worry less or feel so anxious about your own troubles because they pale in comparison. Exactly. Not that we should have compare suffering, as Brené Brown says. Yeah. Everybody has their own issues and their own suffering. Right. But what sort of things would you do as a caseworker? Would you help them fill in paperwork and make applications and help them find food and clothing and housing and all that sort of stuff? Is that what you would do? Actually, all of the above, but most importantly is to be that person that they can easily go to because we are the only NGO that is very open. It's a drop-in center. It's a community center for refugees and asylum seekers. There's not many of, actually, there's no other NGO providing what we provide in the same scope. The other NGO contracted by the government to give basic welfare assistance, because it's funded by the government, they kind of, while there's compassion, of course, they won't be able to do this without that. They operate with like glasses in between. Oh, you know, so it's, so not, it's humanizing. So it's little, yeah, more impersonal. Yeah, it's, it's like an immigration office, yes, okay, you know? Yeah. So for us, sometimes I always tell the junior case workers, my colleagues now, look, we won't be able to give them everything. We do not have the solution for everything. But what we have is that face-to-face -face human connection. And I've proven this so many times, right? I mean, we used to laugh at this at work because they said like, oh, Jeanette is so good at saying no, but the client will walk out smiling as if he or she had gotten something. How do you get to that place where you have to recognize that you can't give them everything? You can't adopt the children or bring them all home and feed them. How do you draw that line to recognize that you can only do so much? So I think, first of all, it's that trust. You build trust over time. And as I said, because maybe I know most of them from 15 years ago, it's a constant phase as well. Hong Kong is still a transient city, right? So people come and go. But a lot of my colleagues, our team, they've been there for a long time. Like the passion is so strong. You can feel it from outside. But it's the trust. You build the trust. And also, they're very smart people. They're survivors, right? So they know when you're BSing them versus literally tell them, Ugh, my hands are tied. However, how about this? And I think ultimately, which I think I got very good at, is to creatively look for solutions. You know, you don't just say no. Just because you don't have this A, there are the ways around it, right? At least they know that you're trying your best. And also, you got to give some responsibilities to them too. Because unfortunately, no matter how good I make us sound as workers, frontline workers, our clients also, if you've been here for like eight to 10 years, there will be what you call learned helplessness, right? So even if you start gearing them up for a settlement or employment, because there's actually a discretionary permission to work now in Hong Kong. Oh, is that? One of the refugees in Hong Kong, who I call my dear friend and colleague, has made things happen. You know, he basically took the government to court and challenged the no right to work ruling oh gosh, for refugees. Brilliant. Yeah. And that's changed. That's changed. It's discretionary though, but you know, it's changing a lot. Basically providing self-reliance opportunities for recognized, recognized refugees in Hong Kong. So I piloted a program and then we can see the difference in their behavior and their stance, but you can also see that they're not used to it. It's like, I'm sick, and they call their caseworker at our NGO instead of calling their employer. I'm like, oh no, there's a learned helplessness. Some of them don't have it, but in psychology, it's common, right? If you've been begging for your basic rights, having hand me downs, government aid for as long as you can remember, you don't know how it feels like to have a sense of purpose to do things for yourself 
So that's also one of the things that we offer at the center, at our organization, is that empowerment, living with hope and dignity and... Yeah, independence and driving things forward for yourself as yeah, well. Like as ultimate empowerment, ultimate yeah. empowerment. That's like, great. Yeah, so just imagine if we're not here, what would you do? Although that's very hard to imagine because yeah. of the circumstances. Mm. But that's one of our strategies is to give it back to them. And also they've got to be able to, if they do get repatriated somewhere else, they've then got to be able to access social services, Correct. live independently, work out how to apply yeah. for jobs and do a CV. And I bet you help with all that sort yeah. of thing as well, yeah. don't you? Yeah, and, yeah, we do. And upskilling them with technology and things like that. So yeah. giving them life skills and work skills and things yeah. like that as well. Yeah, and I think the Hong Kong is getting more and more ready for this. We have seen a lot of positive acceptance from the community. Because could you imagine like the diversity they bring? For me, that's exciting. I mean, you're from Australia. Look at US, the UK, how diverse, you know, these countries are. They don't bat an eyelid if they send dark skinned person, right? No, they don't. Right? Because that's just the way it is. And, yeah. and back to what we're talking about, our kids, that's how they think, they feel, they see things, right? But unfortunately for some, it's still quite new to them right? There's this funny story. So now we have this virus scare. A few years back, we had the Ebola scare, right? So some of our clients from Africa went to the local hospital for a cough. Oh, Ebola, Ebola. You know, <laughs> yeah, I was like yeah, yeah. wanting to quarantine them. And they'd be like, I've been here for 10 years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people can get into real panic, can't like, they? No, no, yeah. no, Africa. Yes. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not Ebola. Relax. <laughs> it's just a cold. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, while we're dealing with this virus here in Hong Kong, we've got to keep our heads about us and not get too anxious and stressed. Be cautious and careful and think about hygiene and wearing masks on public transport and stuff like that. But don't panic as well. Fear can make you do things like like, crazy things. mm, (laughs) Absolutely crazy. So with your work with refugees, you talked about what you've learned about yourself. But what have you learned about the human condition? What have you learned about others? and about people who are a bit marginalized or having to struggle? What have you learned about those kind of people? So I think I'd like to share what I've learned from two sides, like from our clients. I think they're amazing. They inspire me. They're so resilient. Their stories are so hard to tell. For someone to stand up in front of you and tell and share about his or her story, I mean, I still cry. You know, whenever I hear new things about this refugee, I'm like, (laughs) I didn't know that. I cry. (laughs) I'm such a crier. And on the other side, like the rest of the community, you give them a platform to share equally, they do it. I mean, I think people are inherently good anyway, just need to draw from that. That's why I said like raising awareness about this issue is important to us because it's not that they don't want to help. They probably just didn't know that they exist or how they could help. So yeah, I think people are inherently good and strong. What can we do as a community to help refugees in Hong Kong? What can people do? What can our listeners out there do? Well, first of all, get to know their situation. Understand that being a refugee is not a choice. That's a quote from one of my beloved and respected friend who's a refugee. said being a refugee is not a choice, right? And it's true. Nobody chooses to be a refugee. They didn't decide the following morning when they woke up, I'm bored. I want to be a refugee, right? First, try to understand where they're coming from, their situations, and why they are here. Because they're just like you and I, former teachers, former nurses, former doctors, a student, a young activist. Many of them have many skills and talents to offer, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, I think first, get to know them. Secondly, get to know how you can help refugees in the city. Of course, contact Jules <laughs> to contact me later. <laughs> yeah, email me at jules at hongkongconfidential.net and I can connect you with Jeanette. <laughs> there we go. Maybe avail for a refugee walk. It's one of our most impactful and eye-opening initiatives, actually. And then the next step, I would say, is to help us spread the word because that's the well, only I like way. doing this podcast. Correct. Yeah, yeah so thank it's you for great. this opportunity. Oh, thank you so much yeah. for coming to talk to me. It's really fantastic. And if people wanted to get in touch with some organizations in Hong Kong where they can offer support, who would you suggest? Like Christian Action are one, aren't they? Yeah. Anywhere else? There's also UNHCR Hong Kong. There's also Crossroads. 
right? There's also Justice Center. There's also Run. There's also Beth Rent- House helps domestic Beth- workers. That's migrant that's not, workers. That's migrant Correct. workers. Yeah. yeah. And there's quite a lot of NGOs. There's also some church groups. There's also Branches of Hope. These are some of our close partners, actually, who so are doing amazing work. So there's lots of places. Yeah. And you just have to get online and search or yeah. look, and look up social media and see what they're looking for or what they're yeah. offering in ways that you can help people. I mean, for us, for example, we work with around 80 volunteers at any given time. Our team is very tiny, but we do massive work with like little manpower because we trust in people. This is why oh, see, I go back to what I say about giving people the platform to equally share and contribute, you'll be amazed as to the length that they'll go through. So people can literally volunteer. Yeah. And should they do that through Hands on Hong Kong? Yes, we work with them. All right, yeah. <laughs> so, we do a lot. <laughs> so Sue Toomey was on my podcast a few weeks ago. It's called Hands on Hong Kong if you want to listen more about volunteer programs in Hong Correct. Kong. But I think, yeah, people can give their time, can't yeah. they? They can finish this sentence in an ideal world there'll be no refugees oh that's brilliant (laughs) what are your hopes for the future of refugees in hong kong well first of all acceptance and i think now politically things are changing in hong kong while i didn't mean it this way for the community at large to understand refugee situation in this way but it's kind of what's been happening now so first acceptance secondly i hope that refugees are given an opportunity to start afresh. Unfortunately, they cannot get that in Hong Kong. So I hope they get resettled soon. Or for those who are still here, get more job opportunities. Now that they can, which yeah. is great. Jeanette, thank you so much for yeah. coming to speak to me today about yeah. refugees. It's so interesting. Yeah. And for my listeners out there, if you would like to know more, then please just drop me an email and my email is in the show notes if you'd like me to connect you with Jeanette. For my patrons, if you go to Patreon, Hong Kong Confidential, I'm going to now ask Jeanette four secret questions, which <laughs> I'm going to, yeah, which oh, I'm, no. yeah, it's fun. I never knew this. Yeah, yeah, no, you didn't know. <laughs> so you're going to pick four numbers from one to 50, and then I'm going to ask you four random questions, and then I'm going to put that on my Patreon account. So my listeners out there, if you want to hear the answers to Jeanette's four secret oh, questions, no. <laughs> you need to sign up for Patreon, Hong Kong Confidential. And for as little as one US dollar a month, you can listen in to Jeanette's secret questions and the secret questions of many of my last like 10 guests. Oh, mine are really juicy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Well, we haven't even picked the numbers yet. (laughs) Listeners out there, confidants, please rate and review us on iTunes. Please look at sources in your country, whether it be Hong Kong or wherever you live and see what sort of difference you can make for refugees in your area. There's loads of opportunities for you to help, whether it's volunteering your time or supporting in many other ways, training, giving things, helping out. There's lots you can do. So please get onto it. Jeanette will say goodbye. Thank you yeah, so much for, for coming today. Me. It's been wonderful. <laughs> Hi, Confidants. I want to tell you about my Patreon page. I've joined Patreon in the hope of getting sponsorship for my Hong Kong Confidential podcast. Patreon is a great way for my listeners to get on board and sponsor me with monthly payments and that goes towards my production costs and rewards for my members. If you're interested in checking out my Patreon page, please go to patreon.com and search up Jules Hannaford or Hong Kong Confidential. I would really appreciate you visiting my page. So that brings us to the end of another Hong Kong Confidential podcast. I'm Jules Hannaford. Thanks for joining me. And I hope you'll be with me again next week. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please can you go to iTunes to rate and review it. I would really appreciate your feedback. You can email me at jules at hongkongconfidential.net and you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Hong Kong Confidential. If you'd like to hit me up on Twitter, it's at Jules Hannaford. I would love to hear from you. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.